The mouth. The worst part of being college rivals with Gus Everett? Probably the fact that I wasn't sure he knew we were. He was three years older, a high school dropout who'd gotten his GD after spending a few years working as a literal gravedigger. I knew all of this because every story he turned in our first semester was part of a collection centering on the cemetery where he'd worked. The rest of us in the creative writing program were pulling fodder from morasses, and childhoods, soccer games won in the last instant, fights with parents, road trips with friends, and Gus Everett was writing about the eight kinds of mourning widows, analyzing the most common epitaphs, the funniest, the ones that subtly betrayed a strange relationship between the deceased and the person footing the headstones bill. Like me, Gus was at U of M on a slew of scholarships, but it was unclear how he'd gotten them, since he played no sports and hadn't technically graduated from high school. The only explanation was that he was atrociously good at what he did. To top things off, Gus Everett was stupidly, infuriatingly attractive. And not the universal kind of handsome that almost dulls itself with objectivity. It was more of a magnetism he emanated. Sure, he was just barely on the tall side of average, with the lean muscle of someone who never stopped moving around but also never intentionally exercised, a lazy kind of fit that came from genetics and restlessness rather than good habits, but it was more than that. It was the way he talked and moved, how he looked at things. Not, like, how he saw the world. Literally how he looked at things, his eyes seeming to darken and grow whenever he focused, his eyebrows furrowing over his dented nose. Not to mention his crooked mouth, which should have been outlawed. Before she dropped out of U&M to become an au pair, a pursuit soon abandoned, Shady would ask me nightly at dinner for updates on sexy, evil Gus, sometimes abbreviated as I was minorly besotted with him and his prose. Until we finally spoke for the first time in class. I was passing out my latest short story for critique, and when I handed it to him, he looked me dead in the eyes, his head tilted curiously, and said, let me guess, everyone lives happily ever after. Again. I wasn't writing romance yet, I didn't even realize how much I loved reading romance until mom's second diagnosis two years later, when I needed a good distraction, but I was definitely writing romantically, about a good world, where things happened for a reason where love and human connection were all that really mattered. And Gus Everett had looked at me with those eyes, deepening and darkening like they were sucking every bit of information about me into his skull, and he determined that I was a balloon in need of popping. Let me guess, everyone lives happily ever after. Again. We spent the next four years taking turns winning our school's writing prizes and contests but managed to barely speak again, unless you counted workshops during which he rarely critiqued anyone's stories except mine and nearly always showed up late without half his stuff and asked to borrow my pens. And there was one wild night at a frat party where we'd, not quite talked, but definitely interacted. Frankly, we crossed paths constantly, partly because he dated two separate roommates of mine and plenty of other girls on my floor, though I use the term dated loosely. Gus was notorious for having a two to four week dating shelf life. And while the first roommate had started things up with him hoping to be the exception, the second, and plenty of the others, went in fully aware Gus Everett was just someone you could have fun with, for up to 31 days. Unless you wrote short stories with happy endings, in which case you were apparently far more likely to spend four years as rivals, pass another six occasionally googling him to compare your careers and then run into him here while dressed like a teen cheerleader at a car wash fundraiser. As in, here. Now. Walking into Pete's books. I was already planning what I would text Shady as I power walked down the side of the store, chin tucked and face angled into the shelves like I was casually browsing, whilst practically jogging, as one does. January? Pete was calling. January, where do you go? I want you to meet someone. I'm not proud to admit that when I froze, I was looking at the door, judging whether I could make it out of there without responding. It's important to note that I knew for a fact there were bells over the door, and I still couldn't make an immediate decision. Finally, I took a deep breath, forced a smile, and stepped out from between the shelves, 
clutching my god-awful latte like it was a handgun. Hey, I said, then waved in a distinctly animatronic way. I had to force myself to look directly at him. He looked just like he did in his author photo, all sharp cheekbones, furiously dark eyes, and the leanly muscled arms of a gravedigger turned novelist. He was wearing a rumpled blue, or faded black, t-shirt and rumpled dark blue, or faded black, jeans, and his hair had started streaking through with grey, along with the just past 5 o'clock shadow around his crooked mouth. This is January Andrews, Pete announced. She's a writer. Just moved here. I could practically see the same realization dawning on his face that had just crashed down on mine, his eyes homing in as he pieced together whatever bits of me he'd caught in the dark last night. We've met, actually, he said. The fire of a thousand suns rushed to my face, and probably my neck and chest and legs and every other exposed inch of my body. Oh? Pete said, delighted. How's that? My mouth fell open silently, the word college somehow evading grasp, as my eyes shifted back to Gus's. We're neighbors, he said. I believe? Oh, God. Was it possible he didn't remember me at all? My name was January, for shit's sake. It wasn't like I was a Rebecca or a Christy slash Christina slash Christine. I tried not to think too hard about how Gus could have forgotten me, because doing so would only take my complexion from overcooked lobster to eggplant. Right, I think I said. The phone beside the register began to ring, and Pete held up a finger excusing herself as she turned to answer it, leaving us alone. So, Gus said finally. So, I parroted. What sort of thing do you write, January Andrews? I did my best not to glance sideways at the stadium of revelatories curling around the table behind me. Romance, mostly. Gus's eyebrow arched. Ah. Ah, what? I said, already on the defensive. He shrugged. Just ha. Huh? I folded my arms. That was an awfully knowing just ha. Huh? He leaned against the desk and folded his arms too, his brow furrowing. Well, that was fast he said. What was? Offending you. One syllable. Ah. Pretty impressive. Offended? This isn't my offended face. I look like this because I'm tired. My weird ass neighbor was blasting his crying soundtrack all night. He nodded thoughtfully. Yeah, must have been the music that was making it so hard for you to walk last night too. Hey, if you think you might have a music problem, there's no shame in getting help. Anyway, I said, still fighting a blush. You never told me what you write, ever it. I'm sure it's something really groundbreaking and important. Totally new and fresh. Like a story about a disillusioned white guy, wandering the world, misunderstood and coldly horny. A laugh barked out of him. Coldly horny? As opposed to the very artfully handled sexual proclivities of your genre? Tell me, which do you find more fascinating to write? Love struck pirates or love struck werewolves? And now I was seething again. Well, it's not really about me so much as what my readers want. What's it like writing Hemingway Circle Jerk fanfiction? Do you know all your readers by name? There was something sort of freeing about New January. Gus's head tilted in that familiar way and his brow knit as his dark eyes studied me, the intensity of them making my skin prickle. His full lips parted as if he was about to speak, but just then Pete hung up the phone and slipped into our circle, cutting him off. What are the odds, eh? Pete asked, clapping her hands together. Two published writers on the same little street in North Bear Shores. I bet you two will be shooting the shit all summer. I told you this town was full of artists, didn't I, January? How do you like that? She laughed heartily. No sooner had I said it than Everett marches right in. The universe is on my side today, looks like. The ringing of my phone in my pocket saved me from having to answer. For once, I scrambled to answer the call, eager to escape this conversation. I was hoping for Shady, but the screen read on ya, and my stomach sank. I looked up to find Gus's dark eyes burning into me. The effect was intimidating. I glanced toward Pete. Sorry. I've got to take this, but it was lovely meeting you. Back at ya. 
Pete assured me as I retreated through the maze of shelves. Don't forget to mail me an email. See you at home, Gus called after me. I answered on his call and slipped outside. Chapter 5 The Labradors Swear you can do this, January, Anya was saying as I zoomed out of town. If I promise Sandy a book by September 1st, we have got to have a book by September 1st. I've written books in half that time, I shouted over the wind. Oh, I know you have. But we're talking about this manuscript. We're talking specifically about the one that's now taken 15 months and counting. How far are you? My heart was racing. She was going to know I was eyeing to her. It's not written, I said. But it's planned. I just need some time to hammer it out, no distractions. I can do no distractions. I can be the queen of not distracting you, but please, 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 don't lie to me about this. If you want a break. I don't want a break, I said. And I couldn't afford one. I had to do whatever it took. Empty the beach house so I could sell it, write a romance despite having recently lost close to all faith in love and humanity. It's coming along great, actually. Anya pretended to be satisfied, and I pretended to believe she was satisfied. It was June 2nd and I had just under three months to write a book-like thing. So of course, rather than heading straight home to work, I was driving to the grocery store. I'd had two sips of Pete's latte, and it was three sips too many. I dumped it in the trash can on my way into Midger and replaced it with a giant iced Americano from the Starbucks kiosk inside before stocking up on enough drafting food, macaroni, cereal, anything that didn't require much prep, to last me a couple of weeks. By the time I got home, the sun was high, the heat thick and sticky, but at least the iced espresso had softened the pounding in my skull. When I'd finished unloading the groceries, I carried my computer onto the deck, only to realize I'd let the battery die last night. I went back inside to plug it in and caught my phone buzzing on the table. A text from Shady, no way. Sexy, evil Gus? Did he ask about me? Tell him I miss him. I typed back, still sexy. Still evil. I will not tell him as I will not be speaking to him again for as long as we both shall live. He didn't. Remember me. Shady answered immediately. There is literally no way that's true. You are his fairy princess. His shadow self. Or he's yours or whatever. She was referring to another humiliating Gus moment I tried to forget. He'd ended up in a general math class with Shady and mentioned that he'd noticed we were friends. When she confirmed, he asked her what my deal was. When she asked him to elaborate on what the hell that meant, he'd shrugged and mumbled something about how I acted like a fairy princess who'd been raised by woodland creatures. Shady told him I was actually an inverse who'd been raised by two very sexy spies. Seeing him in the wild after all this time was horrifying, I told her. I'm traumatized. Please come nurse me back to health. Soon, Habibi, she wrote back. I was aiming to write 1500 words that day. I only made it to 400, but on the bright side, I also won 28 consecutive games of spider solitaire before I stopped to stir fry some veggies for dinner. After I'd eaten, I sat in the dark, folded up at the kitchen table, with a glass of red wine caught in the glow of my laptop. All I needed was a bad first draft. I'd written dozens of those spat out faster than I could type and then painstakingly rewritten in the months following. So why couldn't I just make myself write this bad book? God, I miss the days when the words poured out. When writing those happy endings, those kisses in the rain and music swelling, knee on the ground proposal scenes had been the best part of my day. Back then, true love had seemed like the grand prize, the one thing that could weather any storm, save you from both drudgery and fear, and writing about it had felt like the single most meaningful gift I could give. And even if that part of my worldview was taking a brief sabbatical, it had to be true that sometimes, heartbroken women found their happy endings, their rain falling, music swelling moments of pure happiness. My computer pinged with an email. My stomach started flipping and didn't stop until I'd confirmed it was just a reply from Pete, with the address for her book club and a one-sentence message, 
feel free to bring your favorite drink or just yourself smiles. I smiled. Maybe some version of Pete would make it into the book. One day at a time, I said aloud, then swiped up my wine and wandered to the back door. I cupped my hand around my eyes to block the glare on the glass and peered toward Gus's deck. Smoke had been pluming out of the fire pit earlier, but it was gone now, the deck abandoned. So I slid the door open and stepped out. The world was cast in shades of blue and silver, the gentle rush of the tide breaking on sand made louder by the silence of the rest of the world. A gust of wind blew off the treetops, making me shiver, and I tightened the robe around me, draining my wine glass, then turned back to the house. At first, I thought the blue glow that caught my eye was coming from my own laptop, but the light wasn't coming from my house. It shone from the otherwise dark windows of Gus's place, right enough that I could see him pacing in front of his table. He stopped suddenly and bent to type for a moment, then picked a beer bottle up off the table and began to pace again, his hand running through his hair. I recognized that choreography well. He could love struck pirates and werewolves me all he wanted, but when it came down to it, Augustus Everett was still pacing in the dark, making shit up like the rest of us. Pete lived in a pink Victorian on the edge of the college campus. Even in the thunderstorm that had whipped off the lake that Monday evening, her home looked sweet as a dollhouse. I parked along the curb and stared up at its ivy-encroached windows and charming turrets. The sun hadn't totally set yet, but the soft gray clouds that filled the sky diffused any light to a dim greenish glow, and the garden that sprawled from Pete's porch to her white picket fence looked lush and magical beneath its shroud of mist. This was the perfect escape from the writing cave I'd been hiding in all day. I grabbed the tote bag full of signed bookmarks and Southern Comfort quote pins from the passenger seat and jumped out of the car, pulling my hood up as I bolted through the rain and eased the gate open to slip in along the cobbled path. Pete's garden was, quite possibly, the most picturesque place I'd ever been, but the best part might have been that, over the rumble of thunder, another brick in the wall by Pink Floyd was playing so loudly that the porch was shivering as I stepped onto it. Before I could knock, the door swung open and Pete, very full plastic blue wine glass in hand, sang out, January Andrews. Somewhere behind her, a chorus of voices sang back, January Andrews. P.E.E.E. I sang in response, holding out the bottle of Chardonnay I'd grabbed from the store on the way over. Thanks so much for having me. Oh. She accepted the bottle of wine and scrunched up her eyes as she examined the label, then chuckled. It was called Pocket Full of Posies, but I'd scratched posies out and written pates in its place. Sounds French. She joked. Which is the Dutch word for fancy. She waved for me to follow her down the hall, toward the music. Come on in and meet the girls. There was a pile of shoes, mostly sandals and hiking boots, arranged neatly on a rug by the door, so I kicked off my heeled green rain boots and followed. The barefoot trail peed cut down the hall. Her toenails were painted lavender to match her fresh manic gear, and in her faded jeans and white linen button-up, she struck a softer image than she had at the store. We swept past a kitchen whose granite countertops were crowded with liquor bottles and stepped into the living room at the back of the house. Normally, we use the garden, but normally God isn't bowling a perfect game overhead, so inside we'll have to do tonight. We're just waiting on one more. The room was small enough to feel crowded with the five people total inside it. Of course, the three black Labradors snoozing on the couch, two of them, and armchair, the third, didn't help. Bright green wooden chairs had been dragged in, ostensibly for the humans to sit in, and arranged to form a small semicircle. One of the dogs jumped up and wandered, tail wagging, through the sea of legs to greet me. Girls, Pete said, touching my back, this is January. January brought wine. Wine, how lovely. A woman with long blonde hair said, sweeping forward to give me a hug and a kiss on the cheek. When the blonde pulled back. Pete passed her the bottle of wine, then edged around the room toward the sound system. I'm Maggie, the blonde said. Her tall, willowy stature was made more striking by the sea of drapey white things she dressed herself in. She smiled down at me, 
equal parts galateral lady of the Goldenwood and aging Stevie Nicks, and the wrinkled corners of her brown eyes crinkled sweetly. So lovely to meet you, January. Pete's voice came a bit too loudly as the music dropped out from under it, she's Mrs. Pete. Maggie's serene smile seemed to be a version of an affectionate eye roll. Just Maggie will do. And this is Lauren. She opened an arm to make room for me to shake hands with the dreadlocked woman in the orange sundress. And back there, on the couch, is Sonia. Sonia. The name hit my stomach like a hammer. Before I'd even seen her, my mouth went dry. My vision fuzzed at the corners. Hi, January, that woman said meekly from under the snoring Labradors. She forced a smile. Nice to see you.